for the interest of time, I'm going to move to our next speaker, which is Amna Lawrence. Um, Amna is a master's student in the lab of uh, Kathleen uh, Gulen at the John Hopkins University, which gave a very interesting uh, keynote lecture actually uh, earlier today in the conference. Um, Amna will talk about uh, using the state of the art uh, neuropixel probes uh, to record from deep uh, subcortical structures. Stage is yours, Amna. Thank you so much for the introduction, Wahid. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm from the Cullen Lab at Johns Hopkins, and I'll be talking about the utility of the neuropixel probes for studying the vestibular nuclei. Um, so the vestibular system basically encodes head motion. Uh, the peripheral vestibular system that is a part of the inner ear, it uh, sends this sensory information about head motion via the regular and the irregular afferents to the vestibular nuclei in the brainstem. Uh, the neurons in the vestibular nuclei either project to the cerebral cortex or the cerebellum for self-motion perception, uh, to the abducens nuclei for gaze stabilization, or to the spinal cord for postural control. Just a brief primer on neuropixel probes. Um, as Wahid mentioned, these neuropixel probes are high-density silicon probes that allow us to capture neuronal activity at high spatial and temporal resolution. Uh, and allows us to capture the coordinated activity of many neurons. So here on the right, you can see a typical neuropixel probe. And if we blow up its one centimeter shank here, it has around 960 sites, out of which 384 can be used at a time for recording. This brings me to the motivation of our uh, study. So gap junctions are critical because they bring about electrical coupling between the neurons. Uh, connexin 36 is a gap junction that is very prevalent in the vestibular nuclei, and we hypothesize that these gap junctions play an important role in population encoding in the vestibular nuclei. And so we aim to investigate this role of theirs by using neuropixel probes. Um, as a first part of our study, we use three paradigms, the vestibular ocular reflex paradigm, the optokinetic reflex paradigm and the static eye position paradigm. And during these paradigms, we recorded from the vestibular nuclei of the mouse brain. Uh, the neuropixel probe was placed in the brain such that approximately 111 of the neuropixel probe sites were in the medial vestibular nuclei. Uh, and here you can see the, uh, the spike trains of the channels uh, of the neuropixel probe in that area. Uh, and some of the regions do show some modulation with the sinusoidal stimulus. Um, we were able to isolate 10 uh, cells um, and we used two spike sorting algorithms, namely GRCLUST and KILOSORT2. And it was interesting to see that both of these spike sorting softwares gave us pretty um, close results. Um, and for the 10 cells that we isolated, uh, they only showed sensitivity to head velocity and no sensitivity to eye position. And here is an example of one of the cells. Uh, to compute the baseline firing rate or the bias and the head velocity sensitivity G, we used a least squares linear regression model. Uh, based on our analysis, uh, we saw that the head velocity sensitivity for our cells, the average head velocity sensitivity was around 0.25 spikes per seconds per degrees per second. And the average baseline firing rate was around 18 spikes per seconds. And these uh, values, they, are, they were well within the range of what has been previously reported in the literature for the vestibular nuclei neurons. Um, so as a next step, we would like to find the synchrony between the single units that we recorded. So for a sinusoidal stimulus, uh, we saw, uh, we, we see that sites that are very close to each other versus the sites that are far away from each other, they do show some coordinated activity. And here by synchrony, I mean that they show high correlation in their firing rate at time lags that are as small as or less than one millisecond. And we predict that if we Z-score trans, tra, Z transform their firing rate, then the activity of these of the pairs of neurons, they will be showing a linear relationship. That is, they will uh, be synchronous. Um, and a similar kind of study has been, has been done previously in nucleus prepositors, where uh, people have seen that 
uh, if two neurons are as far as 300 micrometers apart, they still show syn uh, synchronous activity, thereby signifying functional connectivity that exists there. And we would like to see the same for vestibular nuclei. So in the end, I would like to conclude by saying that uh, this preliminary study showed us that we were able to successfully record multiple single units from the vestibular nuclei, and we got uh, coordinated simultaneous activity of many single units. And this has paved the way for us to study the synchronous activity of the single units to infer functional connectivity via the gap junctions between the neurons in the vestibular nuclei. And this has important implications in understanding uh, how our brain brings about self-motion perception and at the same time, spinal reflexes. Um, and so in the end, I would just like to thank my mentor, Dr. Kathleen Cullen, as well as all the members of the Cullen Lab for their valuable feedback and support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shamna. Great talk. And again, thanks for, for staying with time. Uh, so again, we have a good amount of time to, uh, for a nice discussion. So again, I encourage all the audience also to post their questions in the Q&A panel and uh, upload their favorite questions so we, we can read them. So um, before that, I want to first ask, um, so, um, I guess one of one of the important factors, like when you're using this type of electrodes, is like uh, also like depending on which area you're recording from. Uh, one of the factors is like density of neurons, and then also firing rate properties of of neuron that you're recording from. So, how much do you think actually like such a dense probe would would actually help you to to record like would increase the like the, the yield of neurons that you could have uh, from from these structures? Like how how dense are this like this brain stem nuclei, this vestibular nuclei that you're you're looking at? So this particular region is like approximately 4.5 mm deep and in the mouse brain. And um, so yeah, we did find that they were pretty helpful in uh, recording multiple units from uh, such deep brains brain stem structures. Um, uh, but we did realize that if we like kept these neuropixel probes and used them the next day, then there was significant like movement in the tissue due to which the sites that you were getting the previous day, they were not the same that you got the next day. All right, thank you. Um, so we have a question from Plange uh, Rajboring, if I pronounce correctly. And um, the question is, can you explain more about uh, the baseline firing rates, uh, again, I think it's about the this vestibular nuclei and their baseline firing properties. Um, yeah, sure. So the baseline firing rate uh, is basically the activity that they show in the absence of any kind of modulation. So, um, so yeah, we got a baseline uh, firing rate of approximately, the average was approximately 18 spikes per second. Um, and this was pretty consistent with, with what has been re reported previously. Um, previous studies have reported a baseline firing rate, a rate that was slightly higher than what we got from our study, but that could be attributed to the sorting algorithms that we used. So, so you're only looking at the single units, right? So you're not including any multi-units in this um, no, no. histogram we're looking at. All yes. right. Thanks. Uh, so our next question is from uh, Dong Song, and the question is, what's the possible physiological function of uh, the synchronies you observe? And mm -hmm. uh, does it mean these neurons are carrying redundant information? Um, and no, that is not the case. So basically, when it, there is synchronous activity of many neurons, that, that means that neuronal response becomes more stronger. And looking at the function of the vestibular nuclei, so for attaining perceptual thresholds, for like achieving self-motion perception, we do want more number of neurons to be able to inform the higher regions of the brain. Uh, and at the same time, uh, vestibular nuclei is also involved in bringing about spinal reflexes. And so for bringing about spinal reflexes, you have to overcome the inertia of the limbs. And for that, you require synchronous and coordinated activity of many neurons. And so that is what we are trying to investigate. 
All right, thank you. Um, I had one more question, actually. You know, I think one of the advantages of um, such probes, I mean, being mm -hmm. like, as you, as you mentioned yourself in your talk that you have, you can have up to 300, uh, I guess, 84, sorry, 84, yeah. 84 um, channels at the same time being recorded. Have you thought about, and I think these channels can be spread out around the very long probe, like it's a one millimeter probe, I guess you have, yes. right? And and can you design your recordings in a way where you could target uh, like simultaneously from some like cortical region, like some vestibular regions, as well as some subcortical regions? Yeah. Are you planning to go in these directions or like um, to also yeah. record not only from one structure, but like some other related structure that might be functionally connected or, or relevant. Yeah, not not currently. We are not looking at that correctly. We are focusing more on the vestibular nuclei, but yeah, we can potentially look into that in the future. Okay, and and uh, I think another challenge I would say that is like uh, when you want to target some uh, like this very deep structures is like uh, you need to plan like if you can like easily miss them by by very small amount of uh, like angular mistake at the surface mm -hmm. of the brain then you end up being far away from I don't know how how big are these structures uh, uh, but you could easily miss miss these, these nuclei that are that are sitting very deep in the brain mm -hmm. how do you design your uh, like do you, do you have are you using any like at my mouse atlases yes. or any mm -hmm. any automatic uh, you know programs to to decide yeah. where to insert your probe and with which angles and so on mm -hmm. so we do use the Aaron brain mouse atlas that is shown here uh, and at the same time like we do use these but then in order to make sure that we are hitting the right spot uh, we like try to move the mouse, like do some passive stimulation to move its head and see whether the neurons are responding to that or not. And so we know that, yeah, we are in the right place. Okay, so you can really somehow see like in your live recordings, let's say a band of electrodes yeah. that are responsive to those type of stimulations you're yes. doing. Very interesting. And, and do you also do some, uh, let's say, do you put some markers like fluorescent markers to do, let's say, do histology later on to really make yes. sure that your probes are nice? Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Great. So if we don't have any uh, other questions, I would like to thank you again for a very nice talk and the, uh, the audience for the nice questions. And um, again, for the interest of time, maybe we can. Uh...